Good morning, church. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Good. I did it all by itself? All right, we'll just <laughs> moving on. <laughs> all right. Well, we've got a few announcements this morning. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know that you're there. We'd love to see who all is with us this morning. So on December 1st, On December 1st, we started a new tradition here at Great Street Church. And because it's not new anymore, because we're like 10 days in, I took the new off of the slide. But we began reading one book, or one chapter, one book. There's nothing wrong with reading the whole book, but we began reading one chapter of the book of Luke each day. Um, I know Mark, uh, he has said that he, he wakes up and he immediately, that's the first thing that he does. Um, I personally, I go out, I get my coffee, I sit down on the couch in the dark. I just like that. It's just something about sitting in the dark and reading. And I read that, I go through that in my other devotionals each day. And it's just a beautiful, wonderful way to start the day. So if you would like to join us with that, you can catch up. Uh, we've got for those of you that are analog, we have bookmarks in the back on the table. You can just go through and check off each one. Um, otherwise, go out to our website, go to Grace Street Church, click on uh, Grow, and then it'll pop down and say Christmas Tradition. Just click on that, and there are links to each day's uh, book or chapter in the book of Luke uh, off of BibleGateway.com. <laughs> So uh, then this Wednesday night, join us as we continue with the Why the Nativity uh, Bible study. Um, we'll be, this week, we'll be going through um, Why Joseph? So we'll be taking the message that Mark is going to bring to us this morning and really getting into it. Because, you know, we could sit here and Mark could preach for a couple hours on this easy. But he's going to give us an overview. And we'll come together on Wednesday night, and we'll talk about that more in uh, depth. Uh, for those of you online, go ahead and go out to our website, click on Why the Nativity on the little pop-up box that pops up, uh, so you can see what it's about. We have a link to the movie, so you can watch the movie. Um, so just that way everybody can keep up with that. And we heard your voices. Mark and I took a chance, because Mark and I, and, and our wives, we love the 11 o'clock service, but we also wanted to hear what our congregation wanted, because it's not about Mark and I and our families. It's about all of us. So we took a poll, and the 8 o'clock service was the ultimate winner. And even if it hadn't been, here's, here's the deal. It was 2 for 7, 4 for 8, 4 for 11. In my mind, if the rationality was if the 7 o'clock people were only given 8 and 11, they would have chosen 8. So even if they had stayed tied, that would probably have been the tiebreaker. So this year we're going to do our candlelight service at 8 o'clock. It's that time of year. It'll be pitch black out anyway. And we can all come together and we can enjoy uh, a service as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which Mark and I are meeting tomorrow night to put the finishing touches on. So... Uh, we're looking forward to that. Then we've got a little bit of time and we're going to come back together a couple weeks later and have our men's breakfast right here. So uh, for those of you that haven't heard, we take and we move all the chairs out of the way and we put up our tables and we turn our sanctuary into a little mini restaurant. Or actually, how about a family table? And we have a bunch of guys that get together for food and fellowship, like-minded Christ-centered men to come together and uh, we eat because you know food brings us all together we talk and then we have a devotional so I'm looking forward to that that day is also a busy day we've come to make that our busy day recently um, so we have men's breakfast in the morning and then in the evening we have our movie night and so we will be showing bridge to Terabithia uh, on January 6th the doors open at 5 30 movie at 6, concessions are free, movies free, the heat in the building, 
<laughs> oh, and that's not necessarily so free, but come and, and we turn and we face the window. Imagine that entire window being filled with a 12 foot diagonal screen. And our protector's right there, and we show that. We did move everything to, to do that, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, for those of you watching online, when the music link goes up, at the very end of that set of music is the trailer. And I know Mark's already put the trailer in for those of us that are here so we can watch that at the end of the service before we are done today. And then Diane will be putting in the link to today's worship into the uh, chat there. So please join us in worship for that. Oh, I thought I did, but I didn't. Because I just heard it make a noise. I made another noise. There we go. All right, now, well, it's all right during the announcements. I'm not going to worry about that too much, but let's get to our call to worship this morning. But before we do, let's calm our hearts with the word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you as we celebrate this season of Advent, the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that we have through your gift to us. We thank you. Father, calm our hearts, settle our minds. Let us put aside the things of the world that distract us to hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. See or tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Now, the first thing in this verse is joy. Ultimate joy comes from Jesus dwelling within us, letting the Holy Spirit into us and allowing him to guide and direct us. And he lives within us and he will fulfill his purposes for each of us as he did with Joseph, as we're going to hear today. Joy can be a very difficult thing when it's faced with the many con or circumstances that we experience throughout our lives. I was coming home from a doctor's appointment in Iowa City the other day, got off the phone with my wife, and I was going to dial my dad. And for those of you who don't know, he passed April 1st. wasn't very joyful. But then God reminded me on the way home. He, he, he was teaching me patience with the traffic because it was 380. But he also reminded me that there's joy in the fact that I know where my father's at. Yesterday we went caroling, and we had a ton of fun. And Denise, I'm going to call you out. Thank you for setting it all up, getting all the places set up for us. It was wonderful, and it worked out perfectly. But as we went caroling, in the first place that we went, we sang Heart the Herald, the angels sang, and I know that was hard for Mark and Lori because Harold was Mark's dad's, and he passed. He left, he left us in September. And then later we went over to Restbridge, and... That was difficult because that's where he was when he passed. Then we went over to the gardens and we had gone down the 100 hall and we were coming back and we stopped and Diane went in to see someone that her and I know, Arlene Medill, and she's in hospice. She's not got much time left. And then make sure your heart's sink. Not a lot of joy. We had two moments of immense joy yesterday. The first one was in between going to the views of Marion and Westridge. We stopped to see Lori's mom. And she lit up in joy. And while we were at the gardens, we stopped to see Diane's mom. And she lit up in joy. So joyful were they that you could see Jesus' glow from their faces. 
It's interesting. I remember reading that this morning in Luke. <laughs> Joy comes. It was difficult for Joseph to find out that Mary was pregnant. Not a lot of joy in that. You can imagine how you would feel if your wife was all this earth. Betrothed was already pregnant and it wasn't yours. But here's the thing we try to control every single aspect of our lives. We place the weight of every situation on our own shoulders. That's not what God intended. That's one aspect of the beauty of this passage. As believers, we have no need to worry about anything because our Heavenly Father loves and cares about each and every one of us. And as it says in the second part of this passage, in all things, pray. For it's through prayer that we can have God's peace. Father, we thank you that you bring us joy in the midst of whatever circumstance that we are and that through you, we can have a peace, a peace that only you can bring. Father, help us to hear the words that you have for us today. Let us learn. And not only learn, but let us begin to use those things in our daily lives as we leave this place later today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 At this moment, I'm going to invite AJ and Bowen up for our Advent candle lighting. <coughs> quite a stretch for you to get up there. <laughs> but you're getting there. You did a great job. Thanks. Well, welcome everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Look, that yellow ball showed up. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, today I kind of wanted to talk to you about why Joseph. And so as we're going through the nativity story in here and why the nativity we come to this time of Advent and we're going, well, what is this all about anyway? And why does this make sense? Well, truly, when we're taking a look at this, we need to ask ourselves, how does God use ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things? And that's kind of what we want to talk about today with Joseph. See, in today's world, you know, the goal of many, many young people today is to be famous someday. So you see it out there on social media all over the place. You got kids popping around there doing TikToks and whatever they're called today. And, you know, you have all these posts on Facebook and, and really they live their lives by how many likes they can get for something. And they really, really, truly make that a focus of their lives. And it's kind of putting their hope, their hope in a false idol. 
celebrity endorsements influence the popularity of breakfast cereals. You know, you always saw it when you were a kid. Well, this will date me really well because I'm old. But as you were growing up, you had the Wheaties box, and you always went to see who, who was, whose face was going to be on the Wheaties box that time. And so, you know, if it was somebody you liked, you'd probably end up buying the cereal. And these guys knew it. They're marketing geniuses. So celebrity endorsements influenced the popularity of those breakfast cereals back in the day. Well, they do the same thing with sportswear and even, really, truly, the election of the highest officials in our country. But in Joseph's day, see, men didn't, they didn't desire all that prestige. They didn't want all that fame and fortune. But rather, it was more important for them in the Jewish culture of the day to have a good reputation. And a good reputation can be very beneficial to you on so many levels. And conversely to that, if you had a bad reputation, it would affect you on every one of the facets. Every ramification for your life would be affected by that bad reputation. So in the Jewish culture of the day, and as a matter of fact, in most of the cultures of the Middle East, if you had a bad reputation, you were shunned by society, Sometimes you would have to live outside of the city gates. They wouldn't even let you be a part of the community at all. And so reputation back in those days was much, much more important to your entire way of life. But more beyond that, your actions and your reputation then affected your entire family. You would bring shame upon your entire family. Not just, you know, your kids and your wife but your parents and everyone else, because that is the way that it was viewed in those days. So a good character made a big difference back in those days, and still does today. So have you ever had anything happen in your life that was totally out of your control that could ruin the reputation you spent years building? Hmm. Happens a lot, actually, especially in these today. We live in what's called the cancel culture. So if you do something and somebody else doesn't like it, they go out of their way to cancel you, to wipe out any reputation you might have, and to destroy you. Well, see, Joseph was a young man back in the day, and, and uh, he hadn't really had much of an opportunity to build a good reputation yet. He was pretty young. I mean, these guys were teenagers. Let's figure it out. Not much of a chance to go ahead and build that reputation. But see, Joseph was good. He was God-fearing, meaning that he held God in high esteem. God-fearing means that he had that respect, that fear of, oh, you, you are awesome. You are the Almighty. So up to this point, life had been very upstanding. He hadn't done anything really wrong. We were talking about that earlier today. Some of us had a childhood where, you know, we kind of did some things that probably were questionable to our reputation. So up to this point, by all accounts, Joseph had been a pretty upstanding young man. He hadn't done bad things, had a decent reputation. But now, what happens? Here comes the appearance of Mary being pregnant. And that could have absolutely dire consequences. Not just for him, but remember, for his entire family. Because under the law of Moses, this didn't happen. Period. Period. And it was highly <coughs> emphasized back in those days. So this appearance of Mary being pregnant could have dire consequences for both of their futures and both of their families. So now, we'll see, contextually, we need to look at this, of why this had so much weight to it, her being pregnant, without them being married. So... Those dire consequences. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, it could play out two different ways with that community. A, either it meant that Joseph and Mary went against everything in societal rules and Jewish law by having extramarital intimacy. Or B, Mary had been unfaithful and had shamed both of her family and Joseph's family in the process. So they didn't have much of a choice. It was either A or B. So through that societal lens, through that community, that Jewish tradition, it didn't look really good for them. And they were guilty no matter what. Bad consequences, dire consequences either way. 
not a good way to get their lives started together whatsoever. And Joseph, I mean, think about him. Let's, let's stand in his shoes for a moment. He knew nothing about it. All of a sudden, boom, here she is pregnant. So he was taken completely off guard. And in the process, imagine what was playing through his mind at that point. So even though this was an arranged marriage by their parents, so they, back in those days and in that culture, the parents of both sets of parents decided on the marriage. Had nothing to do with love, had nothing to do with dating, or likes on TikTok or Facebook. It had to do with their parents. They decided, you are going to marry you whether you like it or not. Love might come later, may not. <laughs> it all depends. So, even though it was an arranged marriage, by all accounts, Joseph and Mary were still in love. And, and we kind of saw that in the, in the pictures in there. And if you read the scriptures, you kind of have to read between the lines in there. Um, but they had known each other the entire time they had grown up. And they had a bond prior to that. They had a emotional bond. <laughs> Can I say that right? Um, so... If you, if you imagine this, the betrayal that Joseph must have felt because he knew nothing about what was going on at the point. All of a sudden, here's Mary, and she's pregnant. And she hadn't told him yet. So, another dimension to the dilemma was added in there. What is Joseph to do? So he's faced with some choices himself. He has life choices to make at this point. Amazing. Almost like a soap opera today. So he had a choice to make, and it wasn't going to be an easy one. And feeling betrayed, it would be natural for him to simply just disavow Mary completely for what she had obviously done. Well, we'll get more on that in a minute. But let's take a look back a little bit here on who Joseph was anyway. Who's Joseph anyway? And I always enjoyed the story behind the story, uh, the Paul Harvey rest of the story, if you will. Now, for those of you who are my age, probably know what I'm talking about. Back in my early days when I lived in Chicago, I interned at uh, this little tiny radio station in Chicago called WLS, and we had Paul Harvey, who was in the same building. So uh, I would go in and, and get prepared for my shift on the radio that day, and uh, Paul Harvey was down one floor and at the end of the hall. And so it was cool because they piped this thing throughout the building. Now, if you can imagine, this was an 18-story building, and you could hear Paul Harvey from floor one all the way up to the top. Uh, he had quite the following, and for good reasons. But anyway, I've always liked that rest of the story thing, the bigger picture, if you will. So our narrative that we have from Why the Nativity from Dr. Jeremiah tells us this. Joseph is sometimes referred to as the forgotten man of Christmas. Joseph, the man who was chosen to be the adopted father of our Lord, the one who would protect the infancy of the Savior of the world. In the word of God, Joseph stands silent. He's spoken to, he's spoken about, but not a single syllable crosses his lips. You don't find that Joseph said anything. Now that speaks volumes right there, according to scriptures. So he is viewed by many as just a bit player, extra in the whole Christmas drama, if you will. But according to Matthew's genealogy, Joseph was a potential king, a person of royal blood. So we all miss that growing up because we heard all the rest of the story, right? Well, this is the rest of the story here. So he was a person of royal blood, yet we know very little about him. It, he appears on the scene for a moment and then <laughs> disappears. Judging from Mary's sacrifice that she had, according to the law of Moses at the time, she sacrificed two turtle doves. And so we may assume that he was a poor man, because otherwise he would have had a ram. And the rams cost a lot more money than a pair of turtle doves. So the people, by their status and their statute in that society of the day, if they weren't able to afford a ram, which could bring a lot of money, because remember, it has to be the firstborn, it has to be blemish, 
free. So they brought turtle doves instead, and that was acceptable under the law of Moses. So we do know that he was a carpenter, and as such, probably a simple, practical man. He liked doing things, building things. He had that satisfaction of building something with his hands. He would have liked to feel that piece of wood and stone and that satisfaction that you get from something making it very sound and very useful for other people. So we look at Joseph as, you know, we're trying to build this back picture of who he was and what he did as a young boy. I don't understand. He was still a teen at this time. So we can imagine that, like Mary, he envisioned an ordinary life, but very orderly. Because if you're a carpenter, and Steve, you can probably talk through this, you know, it's, it's all about precise measurements. And if you don't get it right, guess what? It doesn't fit. It doesn't work. And it's a disaster. And then you tear it all apart and do it all over. So as a carpenter, he would have liked to have had an orderly life. Things to go according to plan. Oops. Whoops. Not quite so much in this case. So he would pursue his craft. He would build a good reputation and maintain a good name in the community. He would attend synagogue and he would raise his family an ordinary life by Jewish standards. A good life by its own right. Let's take a look at a clip here. Ah, sweet. Well, I thought it'd been there. Oops. Anyway, we won't look at the clip. But basically what it was, it showed Joseph and Mary as they were dating, so to speak, going out on walks together, going down by the lake and things like that. So it, it showed them having community time, a time to bond together so they would get to know each other on a more intimate level. And you should know that in Jewish culture, unlike our own, the groom in Jewish culture was the focus of the wedding. We have it, and, and these guys next door are preparing some people for weddings and things today. So one lady was in here, and she was getting all of her hair and makeup done and everything. And the bride in our culture is truly the focus of the wedding. Now, I know there's reality TV shows out there, bridezillas and all this kind of stuff. And I, I had to check it out one time. I'm going, oh my, <laughs> wow, that, that's true reality TV. I was not one of those. <laughs> uh, where was I? Oh, the groom was the focus of the wedding. Joseph must have looked forward then to the celebration and the simple life, then that ordinary life, that ordered life that would follow that celebration. And he must have looked forward to this that, that nice, intimate time and just having a, a, a wonderful life. Taking Mary into his household, having a family, having children, and, you know, that kind of old-fashioned feel to a good life. So he, as a carpenter, was fashioning a well-constructed life. But after the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would conceive by means of the Holy Spirit and bear the Messiah, what happened? Well, Mary left town. Mary left town. Don't you like the rest of the story? Mary left town. And she didn't tell Joseph about the visit from the angel before she left town. Ooh, it gets juicy, right? Soap opera. Luke 1, 39 through 40 says, Now Mary arose in those days and went out into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacchaeus and greeted Elizabeth. Then Elizabeth spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed is she who believed. Blessed is she who believed. So we read here about the discovery of Mary's baby. Wow. So Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. And so she went to visit her cousin in Judah. And I imagine they were talking about, what should I do now? What should I do now? 
because I'm pregnant. Here's what's going on. Well, see, Elizabeth was pregnant at the same time, right? With John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And what does the scripture tell us? Well, the baby jumped in, in his mother's womb, mm -hmm. in Elizabeth's womb. And that's why she said, you are blessed among women. In Matthew 1.18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. So though engaged at that point in time, they had no physical union between them. Yet here's Mary with child. But how do you explain that? How do you explain that? Remember I talked about that dilemma earlier. How do you explain your way out of this? It's probable that her parents neither understood nor accepted her story. I mean, seriously, if you were the parents and your teenage daughter came to you and said, hey, I'm pregnant, but it was done by God, it wasn't Joseph, and you're going, right, right, sure. Okay, so even her parents probably didn't understand it or accept that story. And then we have to look at it, because this is a Jewish committee, we have to look at it through that societal lens. And that societal lens wouldn't be looking very good now for Joseph or Mary at this point. But according to Matthew 1.18, it says, The betrothal agreement had been signed, dowry gifts had been given out, friends and relatives knew the couple's impending marriage. Then, Joseph discovers Mary's baby. Now we get to watch a clip. Hopefully, get ready. We can imagine that Joseph, like Mary, would desire an orderly and ordinary life. Certainly, Joseph's life was proceeding in the right direction. He was in love and making all the preparations that needed to be made for his wedding to Mary. of his fiance. Everyone would wrongly assume that Joseph was the father. Wow. Wow. Now when I first saw that, my first thoughts were <clears throat> I'm glad that when Lori and I are going to the store, she doesn't chuck stuff over her head, and hopefully I catch it. <laughs> so, now you see that dilemma that I was talking about. Wow, what do we do now? Even though they had been faithful, even though they had just not broken any of the Jewish laws at the time, circumstantial evidence showed quite the contrary. She was pregnant. And how did he find out? Not by her telling her, telling him anything. He found out by touching her stomach. What would you have thought as a member of the community at this point in time? What judgment would you have passed based on this evidence? Hmm. Well, assumptions can be very deceiving and sometimes contrary to the truth of the situation, as it is in the case here. Human nature would have you jump to the obvious conclusion, even though it was false. Even though it was false. You see, Joseph's dilemma here is the one that I spoke of. He had this dilemma now over Mary's baby. What is he going to do? What would you have thought if you were Joseph? Yep. Yep. And that's exactly what he was thinking. It's exactly what he was thinking. So Matthew 119 says, Then Joseph... Her husband being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Joseph desired to shield Mary from public shame and had decided that he would just simply divorce her quietly. Now, if you remember earlier here, I said that they had already exchanged the dowry and the gifts and everything. 
The ceremony hadn't taken place yet. And in Jewish customs and in Jewish ceremonies, a wedding didn't last, you know, an hour or two. It lasted an entire week. They had, and, and the family had to provide meals and wine and festival, and they had to provide music and all these things for an entire week to go on. The ceremony hadn't taken place yet, but everything else had been done up to this point. So that's why Matthew says that marriage, or her husband being a just man, because at that point in time, it was all done except for the ink dragon on the page. So we look at this, and we look at that public shame that he must have felt, and he was going to quietly divorce her. Because remember, he still had feelings for her. I mean, really, if we think about it, that's being very kind to her because of what she had supposedly done, right? So let's look at it from Joseph's point of view. Perhaps he concluded that Mary had committed adultery at this point. But he knew her to be a godly woman and would never have violated her purity and their engagement because he knew Mary. Can you imagine the dilemma? Can you imagine what he's going through at this point? Well, maybe she had been raped, but if she was, then she would have told him so. She didn't do that. Third option was that Mary had been chosen by God to be the mother of the Messiah mother of the Messiah, just as she has said. Joseph was a devout man, a Hebrew, and surely he pondered the fact that the Messiah was to be born of the house of David, his lineage. His lineage, he came from the house of David. So what could he do? What would he do? Let's take a look. The Bible tells us that Joseph was a just an honorable man, now faced with a difficult decision. And though by law he had the right to put Mary away, he was righteous and was not willing to disgrace her publicly. Talk to him. Talk to him. Some friends agreed with his decision of compassion. while many most likely did not. Wow. So let's think of this. He's got this inner struggle on what to do. See, neither he nor Mary had done anything wrong, and yet, what happened? He was judged accordingly. He was judged by that circumstantial evidence that said he was guilty and Mary was guilty. Though neither one of them had done anything wrong. So here's part of Joseph's dilemma. Not to divorce Mary might represent failure to uphold the spirit of the law, the law of Moses that they lived by, that their whole society was built upon. Deuteronomy 22 uh, 23 and 24 says, If a man has discovered committing adultery, both he and his woman must die. In this way you will give purge Israel of such evil. Suppose a man meets a young woman, a virgin who is engaged to be married, and he has sexual intercourse with her. If this happens within a town, you must take both of them to the gates of the town and stone them to death. The woman is guilty because she did not scream for help. The man must die because he violated another man's wife. In this way you will purge evil from among you. That's the law of Moses. That's what had to be done. So as the, as the city, as the town, as the community, they had an obligation to do something about this. And here's Mary and Joseph caught in the middle. Pretty clear here, they both would have been up against and see, it's not really an option just to go out and divorce her quietly. To dismiss her publicly was unthinkable. He didn't consider her guilty. He was in a position of not being able to condemn her or fully justify her pregnancy. So at that point in time, 
he decided to secretly divorce her, as the scripture tells us. But God had made a special vessel of this noble Hebrew woman of Mary. She was a vessel. We talked about that earlier today. She was an earthen vessel to carry the child, the Messiah. Not wanting to interfere with God's mysteriously purposes, then he would just simply set Mary aside. She would have to leave the community, be banished, he would set her aside. It's not easy to do when you love someone. To obedient to God, Joseph was willing to give up the woman that he so dearly loved. But God intervened, and he gave Joseph the answer. In Matthew one twenty, we read, But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, for you to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived of her is by the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look. I'm giving these guys a workout today. They didn't know this Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph awoke from his dream, he did exactly what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He trusted in God and in the word he received through God's messenger. So what a relief these words must have been to Joseph. Can you imagine what a weight that was taken off his shoulders by this dream, by this appearance of the angel in a dream? Don't you love the Paul Harvey rest of the story? Because you don't get that by simply reading the scriptures. That would have been pure joy. Pure joy. In the midst of what was arguably one of the firestorms of his entire life for both Joseph and Mary, God reveals a way to have pure peace back in his soul. It would bring great joy as now he could live that life he was planning for Mary, and he could do it in confidence. But see, what did he have to do? He was a godly man. He listened to the words of the angel. Now it was in a dream. So sometimes you remember your dreams, sometimes you don't, but I imagine this one he remembered. And so he left, his, he left himself open for that word of God, and God spoke to him. So I have a question for you today. Do you leave yourself open to God to bring peace and joy into your life? In the midst of every crisis that you have, do you look for the joy that God has brought in the midst of things? Does God talk to you in his sleep, in your sleep? I know, I can't tell you how many times, sleeping away, he doesn't talk to me in my sleep. He wakes me up and starts talking to me about things. And they usually end up in the pages in here. But do you leave yourself open to hear God's voice when he's speaking to you? For many people, this is how God talks to them. See, that word dreams means to have a vision while you're asleep, not while you're awake. 
not while you're away. When the angel said, Joseph, son of David, we see God's prophetic word being fulfilled and that providence being carried forth. And this child then would be the lineage of David. And so therefore it fulfilled another prophecy. The life of Christ fulfilled 336 prophecies. Some of these prophecies were made 1165 years before he was born. God has a plan. It doesn't happen by chance. At all. So this is divine providence. This is what's meant by divine providence. Though Joseph was not... Jesus' physical father, by his marriage to Mary, he would give Jesus the true legal status because he was of the house and lineage of David. Luke 2, 4 says, Joseph went up to Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, they had to come and register. They had to come in and register a census so they could be taxed appropriately by the Romans. And then the angel that explained to Joseph that he should have no hesitation whatsoever in taking Mary to be his wife because her pregnancy was by the Holy Spirit. See, Joseph now understood the whole matter and that it had been orchestrated by God. The whole thing had been orchestrated by God. And this gives us two things to consider here. Number one is... The instruction. The Lord further instructed Joseph that the child's name would be Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior. Christ means Savior. Savior Jesus. Matthew 1 21 tells us, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. So before he was born, God had orchestrated the purpose for his life. And as verse 25 states, Joseph called his name Jesus. And that showed, that showed that underlying portion of Joseph's life as he was a godly man. He had obedience to God and followed God's instruction. So number two is the revelation. Matthew goes on to reveal that Jesus' virgin birth fulfilled what was spoken through the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Now understand, this is 650 years before he was born. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He was quoting the prophecy that, held, that was held 650 years before by Isaiah. And that was so that people could understand the tie, the connection that God orchestrated all of this. All of it. Well in advance. So then comes Joseph's decision about Mary's baby. We'll go on in Matthew here. 24 and 25 says, Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did just as the, lady, as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took him to be his wife. And he did not know her physically till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's take a look. <laughs> his wife. He would be the earthly father to the Christ child. He would postpone his desires for the will of God, and in this plan, he believed. And Joseph did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. of the story. So the dowry had been exchanged, the gifts had been exchanged, the commitments had been exchanged, and now they made it official. 
Now came the wedding ceremony. <coughs> so what happened in Joseph's life represents what often happens in ours. Max Lucado, one of my favorite authors, describes Joseph as being caught between what God says and what makes sense. Getting caught between, we kind of like to call it a rock and a hard place. You know, what makes sense? What's being told and what makes sense? Yet, as Lucado observes, Joseph didn't let his confusion disrupt his obedience. He didn't know everything, but he knew what he knew. He knew what he knew. So I want you to ponder on that for a moment. Is this true of us as we cast aside what God wants in favor of our own wants and needs? See, as Westerners in our society today, we tend to do that. We cast God aside until it's convenient for us to call upon him, usually when we've done something bad or when we're in the midst of a crisis. Then we call out to God and we invite him into our lives. Hey, God, if you'll just get me out of this one, and we use God as a crutch, which is the worst thing that we can do. What we need to do is bring God in ahead of time and have God in the midst of the situation, and he will bring us through it. We cast aside what God wants in favor of our own wants and needs. Most of us will have to answer to that one, guilty as charged. When we are young in the faith, we don't have the stamina that we have as our faith grows. And the scripture describes this. As we grow in our knowledge, he reveals more of himself to us. In the case of Joseph, God knew his heart and where his face stood. God made sure that everything in his plan would be carried out to the most minute detail. Because of the purity of Jesus must be protected. That's why I wanted you guys to hear the rest of the story so you understood the breadth and depth of what had been done. This baby must be doubtless be the son of the Holy Spirit and not the son of Joseph. In chapter 1 of his gospel, Matthew reiterates this reality clearly. In verse 18 we read, Before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 says, That which is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child. And again, in verse 25, it says, Joseph did not know her until he had brought forth the firstborn son. Jesus was the child of Almighty God, conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. As for Joseph, he was chosen by God to be Jesus' adoptive father. And as such, he played a magnificent role. Can you imagine what that was like? But the question still remains, why Joseph? Why Joseph? In our narrative from Dr. Jeremiah, it states to, to fulfill God's plan. God needed a carpenter. He needed a man who was sturdy, stable, practical, and yet sensitive to the voice of God, the will of God being spoken to him, being obedient to it. He needed one who would stand quietly with a young virgin who might have been seemed to be the object of ridicule at the time. Yet one who carried in her womb the hope of the entire world. Can you imagine how stressful that must be for, for Mary? Knowing that up front? Wow. Joseph was strong but compassionate. He was able to lead the tiring expedition to Bethlehem and to the stable to love and encourage the mother of Christ. Joseph, as the man of the house, was the teacher to give Jesus his first lessons in the law of God. See, that was, that was all the traditions of the time. The man of the house was also the preacher. He taught first, and then they went to the temple. Then they went to the synagogue. When he was of age, he would have gone to the synagogue, which we see in scriptures tells us he was about five years old. So in those formative years, he had Joseph to show him and to tell him the ways of God. In Jerusalem, when the boy was 12, it became evident that his first allegiance must be to another father. And we see that when he was talking in the temple with the 
with the rabbis. Joseph was the man who humbly and silently stepped back and let God step forward. Amazingly, Joseph never spoke a word in the Christmas story. But what he did, what he did speaks volumes. It speaks volumes to us all. One of the lessons that comes from the life of Joseph is this, that the most important thing the whole world can happen to the least of important of people in the world. He was nobody of particular. He was a kid. He was a carpenter. That the King of kings and the Lord of lords can take up residence in the most ordinary of lives. That the greatest somebody who ever lived can come to nobodies like Joseph and Mary and like you and like me. And this is very little attitude that God has from us. Lord, Lord, Behold us. Tell me what to do and I will do it. I will be obedient anytime, any place, anywhere, anything, Lord. I don't understand it and it doesn't make sense. And as far as I know, it's never happened before in the history of the world. But if you say it, I will do it. And this is what God asked of Joseph and he responded. And God is asking the same of you and I today. How will you respond? Well, Dr. Jeremiah offers the rest of the story for us here. A British student was having a good time in England studying engineering and in his spare time riding his motorcycle all over the English countryside. On a cold and rainy night, he crashed his motorcycle in a remote section of England and he laid injured on the road for many hours. By the time he was hospitalized, pneumonia had set in and the doctors gave him two weeks to live. During those two weeks, a letter arrived from his father, who was a missionary in Angola. The letter, written many months before the accident, finally arrived by ship. Finally arrived. The young man opened the letter and read his father's first words. Only one life. T'will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. These words stabbed at the heart as he gathered up the strength. And he pulled himself out of bed and he kneeled down to pray. Lord, you've won. I now own you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, if you will heal my body, I will serve you anywhere, anytime, at any cost. The boy recovered and went on to become a powerful pastor and evangelist. Now with the Lord, his name was spoken was Stephen Olford. God brought him into a position of significant usefulness through the tragedy of the accident. But most of all, it was that willingness to say, any time, anywhere, at any cost. And that essentially is what Jesus said when he came to earth as our Savior. Lord God, anywhere, any time, at any cost. And that was reflecting those prophetical words back in Psalm 40, uh, 7 and 8. And it said, then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, I will delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, but the law is within my heart. Mary echoed the same commitment to God after the angel announced that she would give birth to the Son, the Savior of the world. And that's written in Luke 1.38. By the way, that's coming up. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, anywhere, anytime, any place, at any cost. And when Joseph received that angel's message, he walked away from what had made human sense to do and instead did what God asked him to do. Anytime, anywhere, at any cost. So are we willing to say today, Lord, I will serve you anywhere, anytime, at any cost? Are we willing to step up and step out? and do the will of God in our lives? See, long ago, that was the road to Bethlehem. And today, it is the road to a victory in the true life of the true believer. It's a happy day when we recognize that we don't have to be completely understanding in everything that God says and does in order to obey. God reserves the right to give us what we need to know 
as we need to know it. And that's called growing in faith. See, he will reveal the rest in time. He will reveal when we are ready, when our spirit is ready to receive it. If we don't receive it and we don't understand it, we won't act upon it. And so God feeds us like a little baby, kind of spoon feeds us as we go. Then when we're ready, we can eat on our own. Think of what unfolded in the obedience of Joseph, Mary, and the Lord. See, it's unfolded in our hearts today, and it made it possible for me to say that if you ever trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you could do that today because of what Jesus did, what Joseph and Mary did, and it was all part of that redemption to make salvation available to everyone. Joseph and Mary could not possibly have known the eternal things that would happen from their obedience, but thank God they obeyed him, and that paved the way for you and I today. Ordinary people asked to do extraordinary things. Most of all, thank God for his indescribable gift in the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to be our Savior. Let us pray. Lord God, we just praise you and thank you that we are here today to hear your message, to open our hearts and our minds to accept that message and our ears to hear that message and to have our eyes see and behold the blessings and the wonders that you have set before us in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are a just God and that you speak to us in different ways at different times. In the music that we're going to hear today, Lord, I just ask that you would open our hearts to hear that message and to us understand what you're speaking to us today. We praise you and thank you in these things and in this Advent season, we thank you for the hope and the joy and the peace and the love that comes through Christ Jesus. Amen. As we, as we prepare to take communion with one another, I want to just touch on the end of today's passage in Luke. Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha. And Martha is preparing a meal. And Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's pro I'm probably more like Martha, worried about the details. Get all upset about things not going the way they should. And then I'm directed to this, and the Lord says, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. As we take communion this morning, it's not something that we just do. There's not, it's not a, a check that we make on a piece of paper. It's about what Jesus did for us. It's about what Jesus did for all of us, regardless. And it's in the little ways that we see Christ. One thing I noticed in the clip of Joseph after his friends were uh, trying to persuade him to run and get away from Mary as fast as possible. Did you see when he leaned up against the green tree and he grabbed a hold of it that there was a branch not attached to that tree, but that ran across. And there was a cross that was like Joseph was clinging to the cross. This morning as we take communion, that's what we need to do. on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples saying this is my body broken for you take and eat and a little later in the meal he took the cup and after filling it he said this is the cup of the new covenant my blood poured out 
for the sins of many, take and drink. The scripture tells us as often as we do this, we should do so in remembrance of Jesus, in remembrance of what he did. He was like Mary. He was concerned with the important things. The disciples were like Martha, and they were they were worried about so many others. And if you think back to those of you that have seen The Chosen, we think of how they are always trying to figure out how they can protect Jesus and how can they do this and do that. We need to be like Jesus, be like Mary, and focus on what is truly important. The body of Christ, both of you, take. And the blood of Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to share this meal, to remember why it's important that we need to settle our minds and push the things of the world off to the side and focus on you. Because when we focus on you, Everything else falls into place, and you guide us and direct us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Father God, we come to you with honor and praise. As Psalms 108, 4, 5 states, For great is your love, higher than the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Let us praise and honor you all the days we live on this earth. For you alone grant peace to the nations who worship you and honor you. We ask, Father God, that you bring a revival of hearts in America. Turn families back to you. Bring people back into your churches. Let everyone praise the Lord who sits enthroned in the heavenly realms, who never slumbers or sleeps, who watches over Israel, who heals our diseases and answers our prayers. You are a great God and so worthy to be praised. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, we pray for Sharon's son, Jace, who has leukemia. We pray that you lift them up today, Father God. Just comfort them and be with Jace as he goes through all these chemo treatments, Lord God. Just heal his body um, as only you can. You are the great physician, and you can do all things, and you will strengthen him in Jesus' name. Father God, we pray for Jennifer's mother who lost a loved one this week. Give them peace in their heart. It passes all understanding. And we thank you and praise you for your love. Father God, we lift up Carla, Colleen, Joe, Bill, Mark, Amanda, and Kelly to you today. They are in need of your healing power to resonate through their bodies. Please grant mercy and healing for them, Lord Jesus. Let your Holy Spirit rest on all who are dealing with pain and affliction and walk with them through the fire they are facing. Let them rejoice in you as they face each new day with confidence, boldness, and prayer. Father God, we lift up the homeless to you today, and we thank you that the shelters are open. We thank you that they are being fed and given a warm place to rest their heads. We ask for jobs to lift them up and off the streets that they can fend for themselves and return the goodness you have provided them to show, to show mercy to others in their situations. Father, I praise you today for giving Doug work and housing, for blessing him this Christmas season. You are a great and mighty God who answers all our prayers. Father, I want to thank you that we as a church can come together and celebrate you as we share meals, movies, and songs. I thank you for all who bless this church and for all who went yesterday to sing to the elderly. 
I thank you that we have beautiful places for the elderly to live and be taken care of. I do ask, Father God, that you place people with compassion and kindness to be employed at these homes to help and not hurt these precious people. Give them patience and understanding. Guide them as they care for their needs. I pray for all who are here and online that are suffering today, that you meet them right where they are. Comfort them and heal them as only you can, Father God. And we praise you and thank you, God, for each and every one of them and the blessings that you give us each and every day. And Lord, as I was praying this morning, I thank you for bringing me upon Philippians 4, 4 through 7. I had chosen other ones and you said, no, read this one again. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For you are the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and Prince of Peace. And we praise you and thank you, God. Thank you, Denise. Well, I guess as you guys have heard a couple of times, as we prepare to close out our online portion of the service today, uh, we did get to go and, and uh, I call it a privilege. Uh, we got to go to the care centers and to sing to these people. And as we uh, finished up our set of songs that we were singing in one area, the, one of the ladies there, she says, who are you with? And so we answered her. And, and she says, and you just came to do this for us today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. Any time, any place that we are called, we need to go. Sometimes this is the only time that they have people who can come and show care and compassion. And I witnessed that firsthand with Dad uh, being in the care centers uh, over the last six months. Is there, there were people there who had not been visited in two years by anyone. Their families lived across town. They wouldn't take the time to come. And so they would really, really enjoyed just coming in. We may not be on key all the time, but you know what? It doesn't matter. To them, it was a total and complete blessing. If you looked on their face and they were singing right along with us, it meant something to them. And they'll carry that with them anytime. So as we prepare to close out this, I want to talk about one of our songs today. Uh, the first song that we're going to hear is I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. And the inspiration for this hymn came out of tragedy and remorse. On Christmas Day, 1863, the American poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow listened to the bells ringing from a nearby church. And he was overwhelmed himself by loss. He had already lost one wife who had died tragically. His second life was, wife was killed in a fire. And he himself was burned badly trying to save her. Shortly after that, his own son was wounded and paralyzed in the Civil War. He was overwhelmed with tragedy and grief. As he listened to those church bells, Longfellow wrote a poem that reflected his grief. In despair, he wrote, There is no peace on earth, I said, for the hate is strong, and it mocks the song of peace on earth and goodwill to men. He had been locked in despair for over two years. Two years. And his hope had faded away. Then the fourth verse shows the faith and hope in God that Longfellow had in the face of his despair. He lost his peace and his hope for a season, but his faith prevailed through. His faith was built on solid ground. And so he wrote the fourth, fourth verse. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. 
The wrong shall fail and the right prevail with peace on earth. <coughs> Goodwill to man. He heard those bells and it reminded him that God was present in his loss. God was present in his time of need. He didn't let his circumstances overcome his faith. And that restored his hope and gave him purpose back. My point here is, if we let our circumstances steal our joy, steal our hope, if we remain stuck in our circumstance, we can't reach the destiny that God has planned for us. We need to focus on God in our season of trial, in our season of challenge, to see the light that shines through the darkness that restores hope and peace and joy to our life. As we listen to the song today, let it restore God to us. 